For example, how many of you would feel justified in the eye for an eye law if somebody came along and murdered your son or daughter? All right. Well, the truth is the majority of wars today are based totally around their feelings of justification about that, aren't they? Mm. Right. You look at almost all conflicts that are occurring on earth today and almost every one of those conflicts it comes from an emotion within us that actually it's just for me to take vengeance upon you if you have harmed me. That is not a moral law of God, nor is it a, a divine law. It's just an idea that man has come up with. The whole eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, which is actually also in the Bible, is actually not a God-made law. It's a man-made law. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. So totally different. Be careful between them because quite often you might read something and see that it's actually, it's, when you start analysing it from an emotional perspective, you can see that it has error. Um, AJ, those of us who realise that we've taught errors, how, how do we handle that now? Um, the fastest way to handle it, and this, applies, this is a very good question because lots of spirits who are here at the moment wanted to ask this question as well. The way to handle that is to feel the feelings of repentance and sorrow about the fact that you've done it. This is one of the laws of divine love. One of the laws of divine love is that if you feel a feeling of repentance and sorrow, that God's love can operate through you and take away the reason why you've done it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, so all of those people, if they go through this process of repentance and sorrow, then they will actually progress very rapidly. The only other alternative to that is to feel the law of compensation of everything that you've actually taught and the effect it's had on every single person's life that you've taught. So imagine if I was a priest living in the Second World War and I actually got up on the pul pulpit and said, it's okay for you to go to war. Imagine if, so everyone in the audience would have heard me say that. Many of them would have felt justified through my statement to go to war. And I could have read some Bible passages where the Israelites went off to war with the Philistines and the Israelites went off to war with the Palestinians and so forth, and you know, which is what they classify as different cultures, and they felt justified doing that. And I could justify you going off to war using this method. And yet, every single person's life who was touched by me saying that, I would actually have to deal with an emotion about. That's the law of compensation. That's a moral law, the law of compensation, but the law of divine love is a law of repentance. If I go through a process of feeling deep sorrow and remorse for that and understanding what I have done, then now God's love can come and assist me through that process. Now, there's some really good pageant messages where Luther, many of you have heard Luther, the founder of the Lutheran religion, when he passed, it talks about what he went through in terms of, he talks about what he went through in this process of repentance and how he progressed into the spirit, into the celestial spheres, which is the eighth sphere and above, through this process of understanding the laws of divine love. And he spends a lot of his time now trying to undo the effects, in fact of what he did on earth and by trying to influence the different people who have been influenced by his teachings yep and trying to influence them to get onto the divine path so so many people who in the future of all different types of religions will have been influenced by spirits who once were that religion and are now on the divine path wanting to help you get off the path that they actually said was true and onto the path that God says is true. Is it possible that he influenced me? It's very possible, yeah. Yep. And all of these spirits you can speak with, of course, if you're mediumistic, so of course you can actually validate all this information as well with them. So, so what you're saying about the law of compensation on the natural love path, that's, that's why if you decide to go on the natural love path, it can take you hundreds or even thousands of years Yep. Of, of working through all your mistakes yep. until you finally get anywhere, yep. whereas with the divine love path... Yep. And you gradually get somewhere, obviously, on that path. Mm. So, so if I had this realisation on the natural love path that, wow, actually, I, I did get up in front of people and tell them to go to war, 
and I had this realisation on the natural life path that oh, that wasn't very nice, that I did that and it's affected their life terribly, I might then work through this issue of you know, what can I do to fix that problem, so I might spend hundreds of years trying to fix that with every single person I influenced in my congregation, right? if I was a minister doing that. And that would be what I would need to do on the natural love path through the law of compensation. But on the divine love path, I can actually go into this state of understanding at the soul level emotionally what actually I did to everybody and through my relationship with God, you know, bearing my sorrow about all of that with God and God's love then can come and actually remove from me the reason why I did it. Does that make sense? Because I had a reason why I did it and that reason might be that I didn't like Germans or, or I didn't like English or I didn't like, you know what I mean? That might have been the underlying reason why I did it. And so, you know, once I work through this emotionally, that can be removed. And now I'm in a state of repentance where all of those actions now from God's perspective are cleared from me emotionally. But I'll still probably have a desire to actually help those people, but I won't feel as embroiled in their state as I would have previously. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the laws of divine love are very powerful and it's important, I feel, for every single person in the universe to know them because it actually makes your life a lot more simple and easy to understand. When, when you read the pageant messages, uh, it, it reveals that uh, souls that have passed into the, the darkest place in the hells have now progressed into the celestial realms because they've discovered these principles that you're talking about. That's right. And the ones that haven't are still there. Many of them are still there, or they're slowly but surely sort of getting into a different sphere. You know, you, there's in the pageant messages some experiences, for example, of of spirits who have been in, who got to the sixth sphere after two or three or four thousand years, and then they spent three or four thousand years there before they learnt the principles of divine truth. And so, you know, then they made the transition. Then there are other experiences where people learnt a lot about divine love while they're on earth, like ones like Luther, for example, but when they passed over, because they taught error, there was a, there was a dark condition on their soul, and then they had to work through that, that emotionally, and they worked through that quite rapidly, and so progressed quite rapidly. So it all depends on what choices we make at the emotional level as to how fast we will progress. So there's a lot of spirits at the moment who are fairly excited about this now, like because they, what they've been taught over and over again, many of these spirits, is that they have to undo everything, the law of karma, in other words. So the law of karma is basically what you sow, you reap. You have to undo everything that you created, if it was in error, is basically the law of karma. Now, this law of divine love, or the law of repentance, supersedes that law, it overcomes that law. So if you can understand and listen to the spirits who understand that law, then you can progress very, very rapidly rather than having to go through this terrible process of trying to undo everything you did in error. Because of course, many of the things you did in error were, were created in you by other people who did things in error. And God of course recognises that as well. And this is part of that law of divine love that recognises that process. Jen, thanks, and then over. <laughs> Um, AJ, I've been sitting here and I've been having this kind of floating feeling of floating um, in and out of understanding what you're saying. Yep. I feel like I'm understanding it, but then all of a sudden I get this feeling of not understanding it. I get this feeling of um, I'm hearing and then I, I just didn't hear what you said. Is that spirit influence yeah. through me? I felt as though it was. Yeah. Quite a lot of you are finding this conversation <laughs> difficult. Uh, for that reason, because there's spirits connecting with you who, who feel a deep sense of confusion. They, they, they don't understand what's being even talked about. They don't understand that there's moral laws and these other laws that they didn't understand. Many of them also have emotions of how fair is this, that kind of emotion that was reflected earlier. How fair is this for me? Like, like I didn't know about these laws, but I have broken them. I know I've broken them, but, but well, what, what's, you know, that shouldn't be right. I shouldn't be where I am. If I didn't know, do you see what I'm saying? A lot of people feel that way. Many of you would probably feel that way if you had passed before, right? And so um, we need to help them work through the fact that they still need to deal with everything at the emotional level with regard to all of these things. So for these spirits that are with us who are listening about the discussion, 
There's a very, very fast and simple way, as long as I understand this, but for many of them, understanding means intellectually understanding it. And I keep going back to this point because there are so many spirits here who do not understand that the soul is their emotions. They need to actually allow themselves to feel. Now, when I talked about the teacher's aspect, there were a whole group of spirits in this state who have been teachers when they're on earth who feel like this terrible remorse about what they've actually taught. But they're not allowing themselves to actually feel their remorse in terms of cry their remorse. Does that make sense? So they feel like, oh no, what have I done? What have I done? You know, that feeling, that terrible feeling that you have when you've done something wrong and you recognize it. <coughs> but they don't allow themselves to actually cry about it and talk to God about it. And that's what they need to do, to cry about it and talk to God about it. And when they do that, then they'll connect emotionally. And as, they, as the tears and as they experience the sorrow of it, their condition will grow. Your condition can only grow if you experience the emotion of it, not if you think the emotion of it. So you can think all you like, yeah, you know, I did the wrong thing there, but until you're feeling that, your condition will not change. For years, AJ, I um, studied the principalities of Thoth, the Atlantean, in the Emerald Tablets. Yep. Um, they seem to be pretty definitive laws. I'm just wondering what your view of that is. And did this man actually go on the divine love path or the natural love path? Some of the spirits who have, have given the laws uh, from all of these different kinds of forms are actually now on the divine love path. But, but when they originally gave those laws, they were on the natural love path. So the laws themselves reflect natural love laws or physical laws or metaphysical laws that they've put forward and written down. And, and a lot of them are very detailed in nature and, and are very true, like very true laws. But you don't need to understand them if you start practicing the laws of divine love. So a lot of us are drawn into understanding them at this level, which is the intellectual level, rather than actually feeling them. In the Bible there's a, there's a, there's a passage that I really connected to in the first century that caused all of these changes to occur within myself, and that is, it says, the law of God will be written on your heart. Right? So in other words, instead of you having to read something and intellectually understand it, when you get into this state of connecting with God through her divine love entering you, the law of God is actually written inside of you. You can't break it. You can't actually break a law when, the law, when, lo when divine love is in your soul. When natural love is in your soul, you can break a law. And in fact, every six fear spirit who's present here with us today is breaking one law, at least. And that is the law of the Holy Spirit. You've heard, and this is, the law is, and you've heard me use this term maybe in the past, the sin against the Holy Spirit. What the sin against the Holy Spirit is, refusing to connect to God at an emotional level and receive divine love. Right? That's a sin against the Holy Spirit. Now, many six-fear spirits, and, all, and in fact every single six-fear spirit, commits that sin every single day. Right? So, every six fear spirit is actually breaking one of these laws of divine love. It's not going to affect them at this level, at the laws of natural love level. So they're going to live a very, very happy life at the laws of natural love level, but because they're breaking the law of divine love, they will never get above that condition until they recognize they're breaking that law. Does that make sense to everyone? There's a pageant message where uh um, it's asked, what is the, the greatest sin that you can ever commit? Yep. And that's it. That's the one, the one you spoke of. The one I just spoke of is the biggest sin you can ever commit. You don't get punished for it, obviously. Well, when you say punished for it, you know, your life can still be a semblance of happiness, right? And in fact, every six fear spirit feels their life is extremely happy. However, they are preventing their own eternal and, and, and infinite progression. 
So imagine, imagine you've done everything else that you can do here on earth. You've progressed really well in the sixth sphere up to the six, in the spirit world up to the sixth sphere. You've lived a really joyous life. You are still actually breaking one law that's primary, and that are a group of laws called the laws of divine love. And the sin against the Holy Spirit, or the breaking of this law about God's offer of love, divine love, to actually transform your soul, is actually breaking a law in itself. You're not going to be punished for it in the sense that your condition will worsen, right? You just will never get to a state of at one with God or grow infinitely. And in fact, every one of those spirits is totally aware that they're not immortal. You see, there's a constant concept on here on earth that, that we are all immortal souls. The truth is that the only immortal soul is the soul that's actually transformed from the human soul to the divine. Right? And this is one of the basic concepts here on earth that is totally misunderstood. And in the sixth sphere, there are literally millions and millions of spirits constantly discussing every day how they can become immortal. And they discuss the, uh, to the nth degree this, this whole process of immortality, but they do not have the humility to accept the very childlike teachings of the laws of divine love to actually make the transition. And so they sin against the Holy Spirit in that place. And remember, when I say sin, and we'll talk more about sin after the debate, it's missing the mark. That's all it means. It means like you're aiming at a certain place, you're aiming at a let's say, and you know, you're a bit off, and so what happens? It doesn't hit the bullseye. Perfection is hitting the bullseye, if you like, and missing the mark or sinning is when we miss that mark. There is no... When I use the term sin, there is no negative connotation of it. Sin is the effect of an emotional condition within you. That's all. Now, it's uh, five past three. So what we'll do now is have a break. And, uh, and if we can come back about 45 minutes time, is that all right? Awesome. <laughs> One thing I uh, would like to point out to you, uh, when we're having discussions like this, what often happens is that uh, <clears throat> there are spirits with a person motivating a person. This occurs with all of us, of course. What happens if you feel a feeling of like feeling tired or lethargic or confusion or any of those types of feelings, allow yourself to connect to them because it, it means that there's a spirit with you with a very, very similar emotion to you that's causing you to shut down a little to the discussion. And allow yourself to feel what that would be about. So let yourself feel what that is about. Like, a lot of spirits don't being like to be told things that they don't know. Just like a lot of people on earth don't like to be told. <laughs> they don't know, right? And so, so what happens is that, uh, you know, what's the standard way of handling that on earth? I just tune out or you know, <laughs> get distracted or do something else and so forth. And often that happens to us over and over. So if you notice that happening in these discussions, because so, some of the discussions coming up can be quite confronting emotionally, so allow yourself to feel about the, uh, the discussion and allow yourself to see what's going on emotionally. I just had a thought. I've just got to check to see whether I am recording, which I am. That's good. All right, so let's get back to the discussion. You notice I've missed out the section Sin and Error. So let's uh, talk about that. Great word, Sin. Three, little three-letter word. It's even worse than a four-letter word. Right? <laughs> and it's, uh, there's not many two-letter words that really trigger you, but a three-letter word, you know, there's two main three-letter words that trigger you, Sin and God, right? Uh, generally, <laughs> the three-letter words that trigger people. I've got six. Uh, <laughs> since when does sex trigger you? <laughs> it's triggering you something, but yeah. So um, sin is a sin is a word that is often treated like with a lot of really negative baggage, right? And all it is from a Greek point of view is just the term. The term means missing the mark. Right? That's all it means. So if we have an emotional reaction to the word sin, let yourself feel about that because you've got some emotions about childhood, religion, God, to work your way through if you have an emotional reaction to that word. 
the word itself really just means missing the mark. In other words, not being able to get where you aimed for. Right? Now, in the first century, I said quite often to people that they need to become perfect like God is perfect. That's a fairly confronting so, uh, topic as well when you think about it, isn't it? But when you think about it from what we're discussing, if I'm at one with God and God is perfect, then I will be perfect. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. In my, the way that I deal with people, the way that I treat people and all these other ways because I'm actually reflecting God's qualities. So anything that's not that is basically sin. The problem that we have with the word sin often is this, this aspect of punishment. And when I use the word penalty, penalty, um, most people think of the word punishment. Right? So when we use the word penalty or the law of compensation, law of karma, which is what you sow you reap, right? we often think of the word punishment, particularly if we've come from a Christian background, right? particularly if our parents have been Christian and they took us to church and you know, we were taught this thing of naughty person. And when you think about it, even in our own interaction with our parents, we're taught this principle of punishment, aren't we? How many of us have spanked our child when it's done something wrong, not understanding it's actually our own law of attraction based on our own soul condition that the child did it? Does it, most of the time we don't understand any of that. And so we finish up punishing our child for reflecting what is denied within myself, which is actually very unjust when you think about it, but we do it. And so when, when we've grown up with that, we then have these terrible viewpoints of like penalty, punishment, we use interchangeably generally. The way God uses it is it's every single law is there for a reason. And the reason is to maintain the harmonious universe that God creates, every single law. Whenever we break a law, there is an automatic consequence. Right? And the penalty is the consequence, if you like. What is the consequence of breaking the law? Now remember I said earlier that the biggest sin you could ever commit, the biggest missing the mark you could ever commit, is refusing the offer of divine love which is currently being offered to you. Right? That's the biggest sin you could ever commit. The consequence of breaking that law is you will never be at one with God, you will never be out of progress infinitely. Can you see how there's a consequence or a penalty for breaking that law? It doesn't mean that you won't be, have a semblance of happiness, because you will. And in fact, every sixth fear spirit who's present with us today has a deep, deep sense of their own personal fulfillment and happiness. But there is the consequence they are experiencing of missing the mark with regard to the divine love law and the consequence is that they will never be at one with God, they will never progress infinitely and they will never be at one with their soulmate in a combined soul union state. That's the consequence of breaking that law. Does that make sense? Every single law has a consequence for its being broken. And remember I said, remember we've talked about the hierarchy, we've got the, the lower level laws which are the physical laws, then we've got the next highest level laws which are the moral or the laws of natural love, and then we've got the highest laws which are the laws of divine love. Now, each set or level of laws has their own consequences for their being broken. So if I step off the building with regard to a higher building, the consequence of the law of gravity is that I can actually die, physically die. Not my soul, obviously, but physically I can pass. So that's the consequence of the breaking of the law. Every single law is put into place by God for a loving reason. So let's look at the law of gravity. The Earth's spinning around 600 or 700, whatever it is, miles an hour, right? or what's that in kilometres, about 1,000 or so, spinning around. You know What would happen if there was no gravity? We'd be flying through space the moment we're born, right? Whoosh, out of the <laughs> and You can imagine that. And unless there's something to stop you, you'd be out there, right? And uh, uh, the picture is uh, <laughs> So, you know, you'd have, you'd have all these people being born just flying off the earth all the time. And so it's obviously a loving 
there's a loving reason why the law was created. Does that make sense? So, but there's also a consequence for the breaking of the law, and that is whenever we attempt to break the law, there will be a physical, in the case of the law of gravity, consequence where I might get injured or even die from the experience. It's the same with every single law. So the emotional laws, or you could say the laws of natural love, are all the same. There is a consequence, but the consequence is upon the soul, not upon necessarily the bodies, although it also will become upon the bodies because of the way the soul is connected, remember. So here's our soul. We've got our two bodies connected to the soul. So obviously anything that happens... Ooh, a bit short-waisted there. <laughs> anything that happens... Anything that happens to this soul is going to affect the condition of those bodies. So this is why we feel so much pain at times, physical pain, you know? Because there's something going on emotionally at the soul level that creates these pains. And the denial of those emotions generally creates these pains in these bodies. And the spirit body has its own pains. So often when you talk to a spirit um, who's in the process of not yet reaching at one moment with God, but is progressing, they'll get to, say, the second sphere and they'll notice there's still little areas of their body that don't look very good, that actually look sick or sore, right? And uh, when, when different spirits have come and talked to me, they've talked about different emotions in different areas, like, why have I got this particular big crack down here? I never had that when I was on Earth. And what's going on, you know? Why have I got this particular... And when I look at my face, this part of my face looks a bit distorted. What's going on there? Right? And when you start connecting them emotionally to it, they start realising what the emotion is that's created that physical distortion. The very lower spheres can't even hold their body together. So the spirits in the lower spheres of the, of the hells can't even hold their body together properly. So they, they have this feeling of bits of them everywhere sort of feeling. Like, it, there's not enough attractive love in their soul to actually hold a physical form together clearly. And so they, they, they are very, very dark condition often and very distorted and gross bodies, like really look ugly. This is why many of your children have nightmares. Because in their sleep state and because of the protection force that we put around our children through our own condition, sometimes our children aren't very protected. And so these spirits can easily come to them and the child is automatically w worried because they see a sort of a grotesque figure, right? And uh, many of you have personally had that experience in your own childhood where you've been so freaked out by the grotesque figures that have come to visit you that you've just closed down your own mediumship abilities altogether. Right. And up the back, is there a question there? Can we have a mic up the back there? Thanks, Dennis. <laughs> Thank you. How can we make that better for our children now? By changing our soul condition. Changing our soul condition. Work. Changing our soul condition, yep. When you change your soul condition, then obviously what's happening is the protection offered by your soul to your children, which is automatic, um, is much greater. So there's something in your soul condition that's attracting it. So uh, a lot of times it can be nothing what we would normally classify as bad you know, not so much badness. It doesn't mean if an evil spirit is attracted to you that you're evil. But what it does mean is you might be afraid of evil, for example. You might be afraid of being manipulated. You might be afraid of feeling powerless or you might have these different emotions that you need to allow yourself to work through. And those emotions, the ones you need to work through, will be the ones that are triggered by the knowledge of this thing occurring. So if your child comes to you and, feel, and says, Mummy, Mummy, you know, like I'm terrified, you know, Obviously, a child wouldn't say it like that. They'd just be crying and scared and shaking. And then, of course, what, what the question you need to ask yourself is what emotion in me is this? Oh, what do I feel? I feel powerless. I feel whatever the emotion is. This is the emotion you need to release from that law of attraction event. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Let yourself release that emotion. Your soul will be in a greater condition of protection. Once your soul is in a greater protection, uh, protection the child won't be influenced by that, by that connection either. She also meant now that they've grown up and they're in their 30s. Oh, same applies. Same so the question there was, with if, even if they've grown up and in their 30s, same applies. Um, obviously, many of our emotions are imposed upon our children, so if we release the emotion, it automatically enables our children, no matter what their age, to deal with their emotion if they so choose. So the same condition applies. 
So getting back to this consequence. Every law has its consequence. You could then say that the breaking of any law is an automatic judgment. Can you see what I'm saying? You see, as soon as if, if, I, if, the, if a law has a consequence, then if I break that law, there's an automatic judgment on something that, around me. It might be physical, it might be spiritual or emotional, it might be soul-based. Let's look at it from the law of gravity's point of view again. What's the judgment of me standing on the edge of the building and then deciding to jump off, right? The automatic judgment of the law of gravity is if I'm too high that I can safely land and I don't have the aerodynamic, um, law of aerodynamics on my side or another law on my side that prevents it from occurring, I will kill my material body. That's the judgment. Instant. Can you see? Now, it doesn't mean that God's actually judged you, does it? The law itself has imposed its consequence. Every single one of God's laws immediately imposes its consequence of being broken upon you. Every single one of them. And particularly all the soul-based laws impose an immediate consequence. The problem is at the soul level, most of us are not sensitive enough emotionally to notice the consequence, <laughs> right? But if we were, and in fact, when you progress in divine love to the point of atonement, you will become so sensitive emotionally that if you attempt to break any law, you will automatically feel the pain of it. Even if even the attempt, not even doing it, but the desire to do it will cause you to feel the pain of that. So do you think you're going to be breaking laws? No, no you won't. And that's why it becomes automatically. The law is now written in your heart. Can you see? When the law is written in your heart like this, you can't break it. It's in physically, emotionally, in soul-based impossible for you now to break this law because of the immediate feeling you would feel if you did. So this idea of consequence, if you could use the term consequence and sometimes you in the pageant messages, the term judgment is used. That is consequence. That's an immediate, there is an immediate judgment of what's going on at any one point in time. An immediate consequence. Now, often we use the term judgment as, you know, this connotation that we have to it today, which is when we were judged badly as a child, you're a bad person. God never feels you're a bad person. Just any law that you break, there's a consequence. <laughs> but God doesn't feel you're bad if you break it. When you think about it, if God felt you were bad breaking it, it'd be a very unfair God. Because didn't he create the law of free will too? And so if he feels that you're a bad person if you break his laws because of your law of free will that he gave you, wouldn't that be unfair? So God doesn't do that. God doesn't project judgment at you. All God does is create all of the laws of which every single one of them has a consequence that will impose itself upon you when you either break it or work in harmony with it. Now, with the highest laws, if you work in harmony with the highest laws, you are automatically circumventing all the consequences of the lower laws. And that's why you don't even need to know them. So if I'm living perfectly in harmony with divine love at the atonement condition level, any potential consequence of a natural law or a moral law, it's like it doesn't exist to me. It's like all these other laws don't exist to me anymore. The reason why they don't exist to me anymore is because I automatically do them without thinking or without even feeling about them, because it's already done in my... because I'm already in harmony with the highest laws. So the beauty of that is that I don't have to even think about those laws, or worry about them, or care about them at all. And I automatically overcome them, every one of them. I don't break them, because I can't. 
Not because, and I don't even want to. Not because somebody's preventing me to or telling me what to do, but because I don't even want to, in my own heart, break them. So, hopefully that little discussion has helped you see the relationship between this word, this bad word sin, right? So cool. And this idea of punishment and judgment. Now what's happened with a lot of religious forms and, uh, on earth is that they've taken the term judgment then out of context from what I originally used it and now imply it to mean that you're a bad or evil being. Right? Now every single person does and can do bad or evil things given the bad or evil emotions that can exist within the soul. But every single person also in their pristine state doesn't need to have those emotions or those thoughts or those desires to do certain actions that are evil. So the truth is from God's perspective you are a beautiful being with emotional damage. Right? God does not judge you as inherently evil although many of you do have the emotion that you're inherently evil. Right? because of what's happened with regard to the consequences of sin on the earth today. But you're not inherently evil. You're not inherently bad. No one is, in fact, inherently bad. I once uh, had this chat with this mother who, um, who said to me that her daughter was bad from the moment she was born. Right? And, yeah, poor girl, hey having that projection of judgment from her mother from the moment she was born. That's a pretty strong projection. And of course the girl is acting out that projection that she's evil, of course. So um, the word judgment doesn't mean these negative things that religion has been taught, taught us that it means. All it means is that there is a consequence, an immediate consequence for every single action we take. Every single thought we have, every single feeling we have, there is an immediate consequence. Some of the consequences are fantastic and some of them are quite negative and sad and painful depending upon whether we've broken the law or we've lived in harmony with the law. So I don't know about you but I'm very happy about the law of gravity. It saves me from dying of asphyxiation within a few seconds. <laughs> well, you imagine being flown off the earth, you've got about how many, at a thousand miles an hour straight upwards, right, or a thousand kilometers an hour straight upwards, it's not very many minutes by the time you exit the earth's atmosphere and you can no longer breathe, right? So, law of gravity has a lot of benefits. And so you will come to actually love all of God's laws because you see them as all beneficial. They help, they help you live in the universe that God's created. There is even laws, believe it or not, that allow you to create universes. So in your future life you will start seeing the effects of those laws as you work through your emotions. So there's lots of things to look forward to with regard to laws. Yeah. 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 Well, from the seventh, every universe or dimension from the seventh to the twenty-second was the universe that I created. All right. So there's also been people who've created universes on the the lower end of that too. Because remember, originally the first human couple were just in the six sphere, so there was no other. There were no other universes available before then. So the fifth sphere, the fourth sphere, the third sphere, the second sphere, the first sphere—they've all been created by somebody. Yep, so I'm not the only person that has created universes. Other people have too. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You will. Would you like to make any changes? <laughs> <laughs> God's, God's, it's really God's laws that create the potential of you creating. Does that make sense? So in a way I didn't create them, but, I, but my soul condition in, enacted or evoked the law that created them. Like planting a seed. So yeah. Does that make sense to everyone? And so this will happen to you in your own progression too, where what some changes you make, somebody in a certain sphere will, and many times thousands or millions of people in a certain sphere will feel them. Every one of you have the power to change the universe. Every one of you. It's through these laws. God created these laws in, with this power that every one of you 
when you're living in your free will completely and living in harmony with divine love completely, has the power to change universes. Now, if we're not living in harmony, we have less power, but we still have an effect. So don't you think that someone like Hitler, for example, had an effect through the choices that he made? And don't you think his mother or father, both of them, had an effect on the earth through the choices they made and the way they treated him? Can you see? We all have an effect, right? Whether positive or negative. But our positive effects are going to far outweigh any negative effect. And this applies to Hitler as well, right? Any negative effect from him being present on earth and making the choices that he made will eventually be overcome and he himself may even be a celestial spirit one day. Right? Every single person who's ever lived has that prospect through the law, through these laws that God made. Isn't that wonderful? Like, yeah. That means that no, not a single one of us can make a permanent mistake. Isn't that, that's a wonderful idea, isn't it? Yeah. Like, how many times were you told as a child you make a mistake? Whoa. Like, don't you realise that you could have... And then usually there comes a long series of things that we think we now can't change, but, but in reality, there's nothing, no mistake you can make that's going to be permanent. So is, isn't that a bit of a relief? Yeah. That means then that you can make a mistake on the divine love path and it'll be okay. You'll be able to undo it at some point. If you make it, you'll be able to undo it. And that's a huge relief. That also will relieve millions and millions and millions of spirits who are locked up in the first fear, feeling like that's where they belong now forever and a day. The thing is they don't have to be that way just because of this one belief that we've been taught, usually from a young age or usually from a religion, that you can't change once you've passed. Or if it's from an Eastern religion, you can't change unless you reincarnate. None of these teachings are true. Right? And if we know the truth, it can free us totally. That's why the truth sets you free. And the irony of it all is, and one of the discussions we'll have about some of the laws will be, one of the laws will be the law of free will. When we talk about that, you'll see actually that what God is teaching you to do is how to exercise your free will in its most free possible capacity. Because you think about it. If I'm exercising my free will in disharmony with most laws, what's happening? I am receiving the consequences on my soul of each law that I'm in disharmony with. Now, that's like a prison. Can you see that? Like I'm getting bombarded constantly in that state of all of these consequences of laws I'm breaking. Now, you imagine if you were not breaking a single law. That would mean there were no consequences. Does that make sense? There is no painful or unhappy consequences in that state. So what's that state going to feel like? No pain in my body, no pain in my spirit body, no pain. All my desires getting fulfilled, because all of my desires are harmonious with the laws of love as well. So they're all getting fulfilled. Imagine what that state is like, because that's the state you're headed towards. No, that's a very, very beautiful state. So the beauty of law is there is automatic consequence. Now, why did God make it that way? Well, God made it that way to give correction, immediate correction, to every single person. Now, remember, we said right, right back in the beginning of our discussions that there's two ways you can learn. One way for you to learn is to do everything by an experiment. See, this is what many scientists do, right? They come up with an idea of some kind of theoretical proposition, then they get together a whole deal of apparatus and, and equipment and a lot of time and effort and they experiment with this idea until they come up with what they feel is a firm solution or something that's repeatable, a repeatable solution of what this idea is all about. That's what they do, isn't it? That is experimentation, isn't it? You can do that with every one of God's laws. What you do when you're doing that is you break the law and you feel the consequence. And then you don't break the law and you don't feel the consequence and you feel the joy of it. And you'll start working through laws that way. Most of us are not aware that we're doing this every moment, unbeknown to ourselves. That's, one be that's, that's a beautiful thing because what that means is that I don't even have to ask God anything. 
I can just barge my way through life, feeling the consequences of my every action, and sooner or later I'll work out the truth. Now when I say sooner or later, it'll be very much later generally, <laughs> doing it that way. Now the alternative is to learn the law from someone else, isn't it? Can you see that? So instead of, instead of feeling like that I've got to actually test everything out myself, the alternative is that I start learning laws from other people. This is a bit like, you know, going to uni, you know, or going to school, and the teacher tells you, you know, maths. And you, then you go to high school and there's new things that you learn, and then you're in university and there's new things that you learn, and, and so forth. You're learning new things all the time, right? Now, there's two ways that we can get taught from other people. We can get taught from others. So let's say we're just getting taught from others, now, there's two different paths that we talk about. So we could say others on the natural love path can teach us a lot of really good things, all about natural love. And then there's others on the divine love path that can teach us a lot of things about the divine. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Question? If we... <laughs> hey, Jay, just before going any further, um, question, one of the, one of the laws is, uh, thou shalt not kill. Yep. Okay. Every single day, each one of us are killing. Yep. How do, how, you know what I mean, just by breathing, there's, there's insects, we walk and kill an ant. Um, how does that apply to, well, if you we know look what at I mean, is it a conscious thing, whether you're doing it out of, or, you know what I mean, or you're not. Well, firstly, there's an emotion driving the question. And the emotion is a feeling of fear that's saying, uh-oh, gee, I'm killing a lot of things in the moment of the day. Does that mean I'm going to have to pay for all of these things? The original law which you're quoting is actually referring to the soul of a, of a man or a woman. So in other words, thou shalt not kill another person is what the original statement is. However, there are also different laws about, um, about killing animals and about the purposeful destruction of our environment even. So obviously there are certain things that God allowed, has created in its natural, in, and we live in, in the natural state, and then there's things that we do by choice which affect that state. So this is where I've talked to you in the past about like eating meat. Eating meat is a choice that you're making to kill an animal. Now, do you think that's harmonious with love or disharmonious with love? Right? For the love of the animal I'm talking about. It's disharmonious with love of the animal. Right? Now, people on the natural love past will say, well, you've got to eat some protein. So, you know, go for fish instead or something like that. But in reality, it's still the killing of an animal. And when you feel it on the divine love path, you'll get to a point where you actually feel inside of yourself the animal's own hurt, the, the pain of that animal. When you feel that, you will change. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's the same goes with an insect. An insect comes and bites you, and most of us would just give it a <laughs> clip, right? Yeah. What are we doing? We're expressing our anger about being attacked, which is actually an emotion that we, we actually encourage this insect to attack us in that way. Right, through our emotion. If we allowed ourselves to deal with the emotion, that insect wouldn't even attack me anymore. So I wouldn't even need to smack it. Does that make sense? Because I would no longer have the law of attraction. And this is the problem with a lot of the laws that we talk about, is we can talk about it on an intellectual level and describe the law on an intellectual level and that means this and that means that. But in reality, if you change at the soul level, your law of attraction will change completely and you, you won't even be governed by that law anymore or that particular event occurring anymore. So we, it wouldn't even need to be a discussion anymore. <laughs> Does that make sense? So for many of us, what's happening is that we're having to discuss these things because we're living in this imperfect state rather than just focusing on the soul development to get to the perfect state. So my suggestion always, whatever you do, focus on the soul development, the emotions within you that are preventing you from being in the perfect state once you get to the perfect state, then analyze what God has created and tell me whether it's loving or not. Because at the moment, we're all just basically living in this breaking the law place, which of course doesn't feel very good. It feels quite painful. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay. Uh, no, yeah, you have to wait for the mic, because yeah, uh, otherwise it won't get recorded. When you're talking about killing something that's living, mm -hmm. where do we stop and where do we start? Because I think of plants as live things, and they grow more, so do we not... You know, so how do you, is, you where do you stop? Where do you start? Exactly, exactly. And the key is to feel your emotions. See, on the divine love path, as you receive more and more divine love, you will know the answer to every one of these questions automatically. Right? I won't need to tell you anything. What you will need to do is just allow yourself to feel the divine love and connect with the divine love entering you, and then feel about what you're doing. See, with plants, there's, you know, I can describe it all intellectually to you. There are some plants that don't die when you pick them or there are other plants that do there are sometimes you need to do something for a higher reason you know what's going on when I say higher reason like with regard to a plant um, does a plant have a soul well some new age people would say yes and I'm saying no a plant doesn't have a soul and even an animal doesn't have a soul but it has a body and can feel pain just like the, pain, the plant can feel pain so why do something to the plant that creates pain when you know you could choose to do something else also remember everything reflects your own soul condition and your own law of attraction so something's going on so at the moment in my in my yard there's lots and lots of mother of millions right i bought the property like that um, and there's lots and lots of mother of millions some of them in some places are just automatically going away without me doing anything Others in other places are thriving like you don't believe, you know. <laughs> so obviously I've got some emotion to work through, do you know what I mean, about what's going on with each thing. And I need to work through that emotion and that will change. Everything that's happening in my environment is a product of my soul condition. Now, at the moment on earth we don't believe that to be true because unfortunately what happens is it's not only just a product of my own soul condition but also a product of the soul condition of everyone around me too, to a degree. Whereas in the spirit world, you have more and more and more of your own space that creates what's going on in your own environment. Right? But that will also happen here on earth. And the key is to put that into practice, experiment with that, and you'll see differences. So rather than answer the question of what you should do with the plant, you need to start feeling what you should do with the plant. Talk to God about what you should do with the plant. Remember, this is about your relationship with God not about me telling you what to do. Anyway, let's look at how we learn. Others, we learn from others. So learning from others means like, <coughs> like you know that somebody knows how to do something and you don't know how to do it, so what do you do? Just go and ask them. But if you've got, an, if you've got a bit of pride, will you ask them? No. Nah, you want to work it out yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed? <laughs> Wouldn't you? If you've got a bit of pride, you want to work it out yourself. You don't want. Or that, and then after a while, you're working out things, working out things, and, and let's say you've spent a hundred years trying to find the answer, and it still hasn't found the answer. By now, your pride might be a bit less there, <laughs> and so then you ask. Right? The beauty of this is that any single person in the spirit world on earth can teach you something. If they're on the natural love path, they can only teach you things to do with natural love. If they're on a divine love path, they can teach you things to do with divine love. Any person can assist you in that way. All right. The other source, of course, of teaching you anything is, is God. Now, the thing that makes sense about connecting with God is God knows all the answers. <laughs> all right? So, you know, the problem with asking others all the time, so you can ask me if you want, but I don't know all the answers. The only person that knows all the answers is God. So what's the point in connecting to me who doesn't know all the answers when you could be connecting to God and find out all the answers yourself? There's not much point really, is there, when you think about it? Can you see the importance of your relationship with God? Now, God is giving you these two choices. Do I investigate for myself? Which means I don't ask God and I don't ask others and I do some experiments. You can do it that way and you'll have some pretty good events happen to you. You'll also have some fairly painful events happen to you and you'll work through those issues emotionally until you get to a point where you think you understand what the truth is. So that's one option. Another option is to ask others. Asking others has the benefit that you can learn things a lot more quickly. Doesn't it? 
something that might take you a year to learn, might take you a month to learn if you ask somebody else to teach you what's going on. But it requires a degree of humility. Can you see that? It does. Then, of course, we can ask God, which requires the most humility possible. Well, when you think about it, God's the creator of the universe. You're going to the creator of the universe. You're going to need a fair bit of humility to be able to hear this creator of the universe tell you the answers that you don't want to hear. <laughs> you see, when we go and ask the other person, we can have an argument with them. We can say, I don't agree with that. You know, no, 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 that's not right. Can't we? Do you think God actually gets into arguments with you? <laughs> no. So when God tells you something and you don't want to hear it or you want to, you, you know, you don't want to believe it, does God say, you naughty person? You, you, you. God doesn't do any of that. Can you see how you need to be the most humble? Because God is not going to have an argument with you. Now, with others, some of them will maybe have an argument with you. Some of them will say, no, no, you're in the wrong space now. I'm leaving. At least they tell you that. Like, But God won't even do that. Right? Because God is the most loving being, accepting your free will the most in the most loving way, and so you won't get an argument from God. But you will have a consequence. <laughs> and the consequence is you have to find some other way of learning. And all other ways of learning are not as effective as the most fast way of learning, which is connect to God, receive divine love, have your soul expand, and then you understand. That's the fastest way of learning. Can everyone see? Mm -hmm. So God actually created all of these ways for you to get assistance. The biggest way, of course, is your connection with God. God always answers you. And people go, what? what? Like I've asked God lots of things and God's never asked, answered me nothing, you know? Yeah, you know, that's the answer, no. That's, you know, and we just don't listen to it most of the time, right? And so, you know, we often think that God should do something in a certain way for us, but, but we're often out of harmony with any, of lots of laws in the process. When we're out of harmony with a law, remember there's an automatic consequence. So if you're out of harmony with the way in which you ask God a question, you will not receive an answer. How do we come to God? In humility. What's humility? The definition of humility was I desire, I have a passionate desire to experience all of my emotions. Right? So we come to God with a passionate desire to experience all of our own emotions, even if they're in error. That's humble. And once I'm in that state with God, God can answer any single question we have. Can you see why most scientists on earth can't receive divine truth? Now, I don't mean that they can't that they can't in the sense that they can't. I mean that they're not receiving it in the sense that they've chosen to not. Because many of us have so much intellectual knowledge that we're not in a humble place anymore. That God can say, oh, no, you know that bit of intellectual knowledge you have there? Actually, you know, that's not the way, actually, it all works, you know. And you know this whole idea about soul power or whatever. I know it sounds like a great idea, but I've got like five other forms of power, which are far better than that one, that you could actually be using at far less cost and far less damage to the environment. Do you want to know about those ones? No. No, I don't want to know about those ones. So, you know, and can you see how we often, often work on Earth? Like many times I've had conversations with many of you where you've asked me a question, I've given you an answer, and you said, no, it's not like that at all. <laughs> right? You do that with God all the time. You ask God a question, God gives you an answer, and you say, it's not like that at all. right? And later down the track, the only thing God can say, well, later down the track is, you'll find out that I was right. <laughs> Does that make sense? That's the only thing God can do, is to say that to you. Right? And usually can't even say that to you because you don't even listen to that. So you need somebody else to say that to you. Mm -hmm. right? So let yourself learn from God. Learn the laws from God. The divine love path is the way you'll do that. By actually having God's love enter you. When the love enters you, your soul expands in its sensitivity to breaking every law. And its sensitivity to breaking anything, in fact, is, all, is greatly enhanced. And a lot of us will say, oh, that's a, not a very good thing. You're telling me I'll be more sensitive about, about... Yes, you will be more sensitive. You know when you see the television footage of a person dying overseas, you know, children dying overseas through war, and you cry, you're going to cry some more about that. 
you'll be more sensitive. You'll get to the point where you feel saddened by what's going on in the world around you, but you'll actually get to a point after you've released your own causal emotion about what that's triggering to a point where you're no longer even saddened, but you have this huge compassion and understanding for what is the cre creation of that event. And you'll get to that point because God has taught you. So allow God to teach you her laws. Now, there's millions and millions and millions of laws, but the simplest of them is the most powerful. And that's beautiful when you think about it, isn't it? There's a, that's a poetic irony in that, don't you think? Mm. Like, you know, all of these so-called learned people, so-called gurus and everything else have all of these different laws in their minds and their hearts, right? But, but in the end, the simplest possible thing you could ever conceive is what God's conceived for you to understand at its most powerful form. Now that just is like, you, you think of the beauty of that creation alone. It's just amazing. Amazing what effect that can have on your life. That means our little children at two, three years of age can actually learn to become at one with God so rapidly that, and a little child, two or three years of age, can understand this process. And they can become one with God so rapidly. By the time they're six or seven, do you think they'll have any negative law of attraction at all? Like, these are, this is what's available to us as a race. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, not you know, it's not acknowledged or enabled yet. Okay, so what, do, what else do these, do these laws do for us? The other thing they do is expose emotional error. E cubed. <laughs> expose emotional error. All right, so every single law has been designed to help you find the emotion inside of yourself as to why you desire to break that law or others desire to break that law. It exposes the emotional error or you could say it highlights the emotional truth. Every single law brings truth to you. Every single law has been created that way. So the basic principle of that is this. There are two forms of, you could say, negative feedback that we can have, and there's a form of positive feedback we can have about our laws. So let's look at the negative feedback. Do you, do you understand what I mean by negative feedback? You know, feedback to us in, at our soul level that makes us feel worse. We'll all call that negative feedback. The two forms of negative feedback. The first form pain. The instant you break a law of any type, there will be an instant painful response. The pain can be physical, it can be emotional, it can be like emotional and spiritual, or it can be soul-based pain at a really, really deep level that we're so detuned from that we can't even feel it at the time. But there will be pain every single time I break a law. Second thing is suffering. Now, the difference between pain and suffering is pain is that instant response to the breaking of a law. Suffering is when it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. That's the suffering part. So if we're in pain or suffering about any issue, then it's because we're getting some feedback, which is what we think is negative or painful. Actually, it's very positive. It's letting us know exactly what's going on. So we're getting negative feedback or painful feedback straight away that we've broken the law. How do we, what about the positive feedback that happens when we don't break a law? What happens there? If I, quotations again, because I do feel that it's all positive, isn't it? What happens? Yeah, this thing called joy. Yeah, yeah, see? Joy, happiness. Now, the list of positive feedbacks are a lot greater, by the way. Peace. Can we keep? Relief. Relief. Bliss. Bliss. Gratitude. 
So there's all these different feelings that actually are positive feelings that we're doing the right thing. In other words, living in harmony with the law. Does that make sense? That God is created. So God's created this automatic feedback system if we're sensitive to our emotions. If we're sensitive to our emotions in every way, we will be able to feel the pain and we'll never get to suffering because pain is really, in the end, the only thing we need to feel to be corrected. We don't need to feel suffering to be corrected. Well, all we need is the initial pain. If we feel the initial pain, we know we just did something wrong. Does that make sense? Something out of harmony with law. That's the only thing we need. Negative feedback-wise, if we can call it negative feedback, is the pain to tell us when we've done something out of harmony with law. And then there's all these beautiful things that happen when we do something in harmony with law. You feel excited when you're in harmony with law. You feel passionate when you're in harmony with law. Right? If those things are not present in your life and you're feeling some pain, then it's because there's some disharmony with law happening. Does everyone follow that? Yeah. So let's look at the law of desire, for example. There's a law called the law of desire, in that in the, if you act in harmony with what you truly feel inside of yourself, you will create some really beautiful things or some really negative things. The law is in, it doesn't matter which way you create. If you create unlovingly, you'll get some really painful negative things. If you create lovingly, you'll get some really positive, not very blissful type of things. So, so let's say this law of desire is operating constantly in your life. So let's ask ourselves the question, am I living right now in what I really desire? So like, how many of us go to a job that we're not liking? Right? So am I living in my... That's a law, that's the consequence of breaking the law of desire, is I feel the pain of not actually having my desires fulfilled. Does that make sense to everyone? So actually I'm not experiencing the joy, the happiness, the peace and everything that I could be experiencing. Now what might cause me to not activate my desire? An emotion of fear. Right? So obviously there's a fear or an emotion I need to work through which will enable me to activate my desire. So work through it. Identify it. Work through it. Let yourself feel it. Can you see how God's given you all these positive things to tell you when you're on the right track and God's given you only one thing that we often view as negative to tell you're on the wrong track and yet most of us finish up living in this one thing <laughs> that's in the negative and not having very much of these very positive experiences in our life because we often are breaking the law. So can you see how it all works together? Like there's all these laws that work together. And the reason why I wanted to have this discussion with you is because it's so important to see that God's done all of these beautiful benevolent things for you to tell you when you're on the wrong track. So for many of you, when you first heard the presentation of divine truth in your life, how did you feel? like excited, just like often overwhelmed with joy, relief. This, these are all these feelings, weren't they? Yeah. Initially. Initially, that's what you felt, wasn't it? Yeah. Right. And then I talked about this thing called emotions, like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> How did you start feeling then? Like, see, can you say, we start feeling some of this now. And, then. and the reason why is because initially our joy at finding truth was the positive feedback we needed from God to tell us that we're actually finding truth. And then what happens is we go into doubt. We go into this other emotion, which is a pain-based emotion, fear-based emotion of doubt. And when we kick into doubt, all of these other things start happening. Now, obviously, if I've got a heap of stored emotion that's painful in me, I need to release it. So I'm going to, on the divine love path, not always receive these feelings because I've stored these ones for such a long time that they're going to have to come out now. Right? So I'm not talking about that process. I'm talking about when you actually allow them to all start coming out, you will get out of this pain or suffering cycle and you'll just be feeling the pains initially that you have suppressed and eventually all those will have gone and then where will you be? just in the positive feedback mode, in the, in the way that in which we experience everything. So let yourself trust your feelings. What is your soul? 
It's your feelings, your emotions, your passions, your desires. Lately I've had a lot of people ask me, oh, such and such, I thought such and such came along, a spirit person came along to talk to me the other day. What do you think? And I'm saying, well, hang on a sec, what do you feel? Was it that person or not? Well, yes, I feel it was that person. So why do you need me to confirm it? Why aren't you trusting your soul? Can you see? Most of the time we're not trusting our soul. Most of the time what we're doing is wanting, we have all these emotions that cause us to not trust our soul and so we kick in our intellect and your intellect is thoroughly useless at helping you with your soul. <laughs> like, honestly, it's like it, 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 the only thing it's good for really in terms of helping with the soul is like, yes, I want to feel all my emotions. Like, But even then, if your soul feels, no, I don't want to feel any of my emotions, <laughs> your intellect's not going to help you there either. right? So can you see like the intellect is this, is this very, very limited tool that you have that most of us live in for a long, long time on the earth that we, we need to give that up and start living in the feelings and the emotions and noticing the negative and positive feedback that occurs in our lives. When we notice these, this feedback occurring in our lives, we know straight away the law is spoken. So what, in terms of a practical situation, what happened for myself is for years and years, and I've described this to you before, for years and years I was wanting a relationship with a woman who did not want a relationship with me, right? And almost every single day I would cry about that. <laughs> right, what's going on? Suffering. suffering. <laughs> I'm suffering. Why am I suffering? I'm breaking a eh? law. law. What would this law be? A law related to self-love it must be. right? Can I, can I see if I'm suffering I can start knowing what's going on? Can you see that? Yeah. Let's give you another example. Let's say all of a sudden there's this pain that starts developing in my body and I go along to the doctor and I find out I've got cancer. Pain is saying I've broken a law. Okay, so what would the law be? Where's the cancer? Well, let's say it's in my left breast. What would it be? Well, see, now you're all kicking into your intellect. What you need to do is feel what it's about, don't you, right? Don't you? you need, if it's you, your body, you need to start feeling what it's about. Now, we've been taught by some other, by, by others, it's to do with an emotion that I'm suppressing, and there's, there's suppressed anger, so I know it's related to some anger I feel, and so forth. And then if I just let the law of uh, attraction tell me what that's about. So I pray to God, I ask God, please tell me what this is about. Next day, I get a man very angry with me and I just placate him. Right? And I know, ah, oh, man, he's angry with me and instead of me, I didn't allow my anger, I suppressed my anger and instead I got that. And I'm not suggesting you allow the anger and verbalize, verbally abuse him as well. What I'm saying is feel the emotional desire within you to do that and allow yourself to see what it is. There's God's message straight away. There's my answer. I know what it is. And this will happen to you like that, instantly like that, constantly, if you allow yourself to see the positive and negative feedback that comes from actually dealing with law. Can you see that? And you don't need anyone else to help you do that then, do you? You can do that yourself. Yeah? You can just trust your own feelings at the soul level and go ahead with that. Now if you trust your feelings and make a mistake, what happens? There's a consequence, which will be painful and you'll notice. But are you punished for it? No. no. So you don't have to worry about that. It's just that you know you just did the wrong thing, obviously you're on the wrong track. Now unfortunately for me I'm a very slow learner so you know the suffering continues for years and years and years before I learned one thing about love for example in the, in the example that I gave you. But if we're sensitive to it and at the beginning I was not sensitive to it that's why it took so long. But if you're sensitive to it you can see it can be quite a rapid process, couldn't it? If you're sensitive to what's going on. So allow yourself to be sensitive to the response that your soul has to breaking the law. AJ, what if a, a situation brings all of those feedbacks, both positive and negative? 
then there is a certain law you're breaking and a certain law you're not. Okay. Uh, the, the truth is, if you're not breaking a law, there are no negative events and, or negative consequences unless it's an old experience. So that's the only proviso. So, if it, so let's say something triggers an emotion in me that relates to an emotion when I was three with regard to my father that I stored and suppressed. Well, obviously, if that's coming out, then that's still a positive experience. Does that make sense? Because I'm actually now feeling the pain that created my suffering. Yeah. And I do need to do that. Yeah. So that's the only time in which we will have painful experiences is the stored pain of our previous experience. Okay, so how can you tell the difference if you're actually reliving and re-experiencing stored pain or whether that, say, a relationship is causing you um, suffering in the now. Stored pain always occurs at an age. So when you relive it, you will always feel that age. Do you follow me? Yep. Yep. So so if I'm three and I'll feel three year I'll feel childish. I'll feel childish in the expression of that stored emotion. If I'm in an adult phase of it of anger or rage, then I'm not experiencing that emotion and I'm now experiencing the pain of suppressing that emotion or the mm -hmm. suffering, I would say, of suppressing that emotion. Mm -hmm. Every emotion you experience that's been stored in you, you will release and when you release it, the event that it's related to will generally flow through you as well, yeah. no matter what age it was that it occurred. So you'll know the difference. You will also feel it in your body there will be feelings or sensations in your body that feels like things leaving you or changes occurring in your body. Many of you have experienced this already where you've had a huge emotional reaction to something and you realize it was related to something that happened when you were five or four or something and then when you came out of that your body will feel different. The first few days it will feel like oh it's making any sort of adjustments and changes and then after a while it all settles down and you feel quite differently in you. That's how you know that it's been related to something that's been causal from an old stored emotion. Mm -hmm. Stuff that continues to go on and on and on and on are things to do like crying every day about an adult event that occurred last week, you know, or last month. Because it, the real emotion is not about that. Mm -hmm. It's always related to something earlier than that generally. Mm -hmm. right? So allow yourself to find out what that is. And this is where prayer is so important. If you pray to God about it, God will use whatever God has at her resources to try and assist you to find the answer to your question, if you're open to hearing the answer. The problem is, as we'll talk about tomorrow, many of us are not open to hearing answers where we are creating problems for ourselves or others. We're totally happy, I'm totally happy to hear that Peter hurt me. I'm not totally happy to hear that I hurt Peter. Does that make sense? I'm totally happy to hear things where I've damaged, you know, other, other people have damaged me, but when, I, when I've damaged other people, usually I'm very resistive. Straight behind. In our busy lives, AJ, I'm wondering for myself, been on this path for four or five months now, yep. I'm trying to access that feeling of humility while I'm working or I'm driving a car or something yep. because an emotion will come up and I'm trying to go into that space and allow me to go to wherever I need to go to without any conditioning of, of some sort. Yep. Have you, can you give us some advice on how we can do that? Because I'm finding it, I'm, unless I've created my own roadblock around that. Yeah. Now, just one piece of advice and that is if I'm not experiencing a causal emotion right now that's been stored inside of me, then I have a resistance to experiencing it. So, now, what that means, that what that advice means, is that let's say I know there was an event when I was two or three years of age or something like that, or, or even let's say I'm driving along the car, I'll give this example instead, we're driving along the car, and somebody cuts me off and I feel the rage, feel the rage towards that person. Well, right at that moment I'm in denial of a causal emotion. Because the rage is created by my denial of a causal emotion. All right? So I feel the rage because I still need to feel all my emotions. So I feel my rage and as I, as I allow myself to sink into it, I ask myself, what is my, my block or my fear covering? See, a lot of this path is not about feeling the causal emotion so much because that will normally flow when you access it. 
just like a child's does, right? You know, you take a child along to the shopping centre, deny it a lolly, what happens? Yeah, straight away, you know, there's no, there's no, there's no thought about it. Is there? Oh, I'm going to get embarrassed if I cry now. I'll put it off or anything like that. It doesn't do any of that, right? It just flows out of it. The child has its emotion. You will be like that in the end. Now, if you're not like that right now, instead of focusing on trying to get to the emotion, focus on what's blocking you from getting to the emotion. Pray about what you're afraid of about getting to the emotion. Because you must be afraid of something. Something's blocking you. Because if it wasn't, you'd be feeling the causal emotion. So every time I feel anger or rage or one of those kind of emotions, I know straight away I'm actually afraid of something deeper and there's a block preventing me from accessing the thing deeper. And it's oftentimes also a choice, by the way, to feel the, feel the anger the, the block in itself creates a, deep, a, a bigger emotion. So the block might be fear about something, which will create the choice to get angry. Right? So if I know that I'm feeling that, all I need to do is just say, oh, I'm blocking something. Do you really want to know what it is? Probably not. If I'm angry, I probably don't want to know. <laughs> Agreed? Because yeah. if I wanted to know, there's a pretty good chance that I'd already be knowing it. So I don't even want to know what it is. In fact, I'm peed off with the whole idea that I need to know what it is. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And allow yourself then to actually feel that you are purposefully choosing to deny a causal emotion rather than trying to access the causal emotion. Does that make sense? So, so let yourself identify those blocking type emotions. The blocking emotions all are the emotions that prevent the automatic flow of emotion out of you. Now, a blocking emotion might be something like, oh, I'm afraid of what other people will, will think of me if I do it. Or it might be that, you know, I view emotions as weak. Inside of me, I have this feeling that if I'm emotional, I'm weak. Um, I have a feeling, you know, which is a fear of vulnerability. If other people see me being emotional, they'll be able to use that against me. You know, there's all sorts of blocking emotions that prevent us from feeling the emotions themselves that are underneath. Unfortunately, the hardest task on the divine love path is to actually deal with your blockages, right? Once you deal with your blockages, the underlying emotion just flows out of you, you know, and it's such a beautiful experience then because you can feel the change. But the hardest part and the most thankless part, part of the divine love path, it seems at times, is this process of actually feeling the block to the emotion. So allow yourself to experience that. Yep. So, getting back to our discussion about law, can you see how beautiful God's laws are? They've all been there to create this beautiful surroundings for you to actually access every single emotion within you that prevents your connection with God. And you don't need anybody else to help you, only if you connect with God and you have humility, you can actually do the whole lot without assistance. But why would you want to do that when you've got people around you, spirit friends around you who can assist you, as long as you're humble? Why wouldn't you just connect with them, let them feel, let yourself feel what God has given you to identify whether you're actually progressing or not. Let yourself do that. God has created these beautiful loving laws and later, over the coming months, I'll be talking about different laws in detail and how you can actually activate them to experience your joy in your life. Right? But God has created all of these laws for your benefit, for your soul's benefit. They all have joyful consequences if you follow them. They all have painful consequences if you deny them. And that's beautiful in itself. Because it means, in the end, that everyone on this planet at some point in time will understand that one principle, and everyone in the spirit world at some point in time in the future will understand that one principle, and we'll be able to get from where we are universally and particularly here on earth in this place where there's still a lot of war, crime, suffering, pain and all these things and we'll be able to get rid of all of those things just by understanding this process within ourselves. And we can choose to follow the natural love path if that's the way we want to do it or we can choose to follow the divine love path if that's the way we want to do it. We have the free will to choose either path and we can progress in such a manner that this whole world will change around us as a result. 
I was just uh, wondering, um, at, a, at a soul level, you said from uh, level six below, they're not immortal. I was just wondering how long we've got if we don't pick up the message. <laughs> and the, it's not known, the reason why I say it, they're, not, they're not immortal, and it's not known whether they're immortal or not. So what I mean by that is, is that when you receive divine love into your soul, a part of God has actually entered your soul. Now, since God can never be destroyed, it now means that you can never be destroyed. Because if you were, God would actually cease to exist too. Does that make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. This is what immortality really means. When we're on the natural love path, because a part of God has not entered us yet, there is no knowledge within me and there's no technical or scientific foundation in me to believe that I'm immortal. Now, my body might live a long time, for many thousands or hundreds of thousands of years even, um, in that state, in the six sphere natural love state. But change is an internal, eternal uh, thing in the universe. Every single thing in the universe changes sooner or later. So how a six sphere spirit will change in the future, we don't know because they have yet to receive divine love, so therefore they can't progress to the seventh sphere and beyond. So they're not changing in love. They're shifting from side to side, but we don't know how that's going to affect their soul in the long run because we haven't lived long enough to know yet. So as to how what will happen, I don't know. But one thing I do know for certain is they, have, they are not immortal and so therefore may, in fact, change or even perish in one form and, and be created in another, I don't know. And no one really knows the answer to that until it happens. So this is why it's so important to even discuss this principle of divine love. Divine love gives you this potential of growing forever, of ch continually changing. Who of you likes change? <laughs> not many of you like change. This is not a good thing, <laughs> right? Change is an essential part of what you will come to like, right? Your resistance to change now is actually preventing your own growth. Do you see that? So allow yourself to start changing. Okay, the, the change with, from your natural soul into your divine soul, again, can be a gradual process? It's always going to be a gradual process. Like the, the sinner does not become the saint overnight. Right. Now, <laughs> duh, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of religions say you have a deathbed repentance and what happens? Oh, yeah. Now you're in heaven, you don't have to go to hell anymore. Right? This is not how it works. The changes have to happen at the soul level. So every single change, and this is the beauty of it when you think about it, every single change has to happen at the soul level and so therefore it will be real. It'll be something that you actually will feel inside of yourself as a real change. So allow yourself to make the changes. Allow yourself to feel the changes that you need to feel in order to progress. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> within the um, laws of divine love, where does divine grace fit in, or is that just terminology? Um, I, I would, it's a law. Uh, it's to do with forgiveness and repentance, and it's one of the things I've already discussed. Remember the laws of forgiveness and repentance that I discussed? Grace is one of those, is one of those laws that, that are a part of that a group of laws. I often think of grace as, as the process of God removing the causal emotion from within you because you have worked through the issue of repentance about things. Right? And God doesn't expect you to pay the penalties of it all. And that's the grace involved. See, what, what we do on earth here, if somebody sins against us, if somebody actually does something harmful against us, we want them generally to feel all the pain you thought, I felt about what they did, don't we? And even a bit more would be good, so they don't do it again. <laughs> right? That's how we feel, right? If God felt that way, none of us would ever exist, right? So, so God doesn't feel that way. What God feels is this feeling that once you come to recognize the causal emotions within yourself that created you or motivated you 
to take the actions you took disharmonious with love and are willing to experience that emotionally, God can remove the cause. That's grace. And, and, and not only remove the cause, but remove all the potential law of compensation effects as a result. And that's, that's really, really beautiful when you think about it. It means if I've done something like Hitler has done, right, I can actually progress because if, if I'd done something like Hitler has done with the law of compensation, you imagine, you imagine how hard it would be to progress. Like you've got alone, you know, quite a few million Jews have been slaughtered, right? And then you've got, you know, the, the motivations for war and all these other things that went on and, and not that he's totally, like he, he's not the only person responsible for all of that, but I'm just giving an illustration. And the illustration is that this, all these dark emotions in his soul, imagine if you just killed one person, the effect on how many people, how many people does that affect? It affects their family, their friends, it affects... That affects their life on earth, it affects their potential children they could have had. Like, how do you fix all of that? Like, that's a pretty big thing to even attempt to fix, even killing one person. Now just multiply that by 10 million. Right? How hard would that be? You know, with the law of divine love, it's all able to be repaired. But with the law of compensation, it's able to be repaired, but obviously will take a long, long time. By the way, just by, before we ask the next question, uh, the spirits here are now starting to feel like a bit more buoyant, buoyant which is good, um, and are starting to feel like there's a you know there's a way through uh, working through these things, understanding law and so forth. So that's really good. So I just want to encourage them for a moment, just to now they don't really need to listen to the rest of our conversation. All they need to do now is just connect to some brighter divine love spirits and. And they can uh, speak with the, you about uh, what's happening in your life and how to work through your emotions. And that's really, that, that's all enough now for you. You don't need to stick around any further if you don't want to. So. Yeah. Um, the, on the question of divine grace, uh, I was talking earlier on to somebody about that today, just now, at uh, the break. And I felt that every one of us that have been here today, um, are receiving divine grace by the fact that out of six billion people on the planet, uh, however many are in this room, are sitting, yep. listening to, you know, uh, and receiving God's gifts through you. Yep. You know, yep. I feel that's really an amazing, amazing gift. And it says a lot for your own law of attraction yeah. uh, as exactly. well, in terms of how much you desire truth and how much you want to to practice truth. So, so even if you're getting downhearted sometimes and you're feeling like, oh, you know, you know, this all seems pretty hard and you're feeling like you're not really getting through your emotions, the fact is that being here has, has its own law of attraction. The fact is that you're you know, learning things you've never learned before. That all is coming from your own desire. You've really got yourself to thank, <laughs> right? You have. But you also have God to thank too, obviously, because you know, this is a beautiful truth that, that very few people in the past have ever learnt on the earth. Yeah. But, but you're now learning them on the earth. And the, the, the beauty of that is unimaginable for you in the future. You, you have no idea what that's going to mean for your future, even if you pass, in terms of the average person who passes and the experiences that you will not have to have, that they have had to have in order to learn these lessons. So there's a lot of beautiful things happening and, and, and so therefore don't, don't cover over what you're learning either. Many of you have still got a lot of fear about what you're learning. You know, what are other people going to think of me learning this crackpot stuff? When, not that you think it's crackpot stuff, right? Otherwise you wouldn't be here. But, but you often feel that other people will feel that you're a crackpot, right? So deal with that emotion. Work your way through that emotion. Let yourself release it so that in the future you can actually speak openly about these truths that are, that are bringing joy to your own heart. Huh? So, let's look at the response to divine law. Divine law is a good thing. It maintains the harmony of the universe. Divine law also is a good thing for you personally because it's your feedback mechanism telling you what's bringing you closer to God or taking you further away from God. It's a, so it's a beautiful thing. Allow yourself to come to appreciate God's laws. 
One of, the, one of my personal passions for the last 2,000 years has been investigating God's laws surrounding the soul. Right? And the reason why it's been a really big personal passion for me is it has such a huge benefit on not only my own soul, but every single person who I can teach those laws to. So allow yourself to really feel these laws in your own life and allow yourself to begin teaching those laws to others and understanding them yourself completely. And remember that the simplest laws are the most powerful ones. So it's not going to be this big complicated process of you learning this and learning that and learning this over hundreds of years, you know, and then eventually you get to the stage where you understand. It's not like that at all. It can be a very, very rapid process that a child can understand. So hopefully today, with what we've gone through, it's giving you a bit of an overview or an introduction to God's laws. What we're going to do now, from now on, is we're going to start looking at some of the laws in a more detailed way, in terms of how different laws can benefit you. Tomorrow, what we're going to be focusing on tomorrow is some of the laws that affect how you love other people. So that what I would call a group of laws. There's a group of laws surrounding your love of another, and we want to talk about some of those laws tomorrow. The next time we get together, which will be two weeks' time down in Brisbane, we'll talk about the laws surrounding the love of yourself. So many of us are still experiencing not very much love of self, right? And we're working through these emotions of love of self. So that's going to be very beneficial to look at what kind of actions and things that we need to do to affect our love of self. Then the day after that, what we're going to do is incorporate those two laws or lessons of laws, if you like, into your relationships, into your romantic relationships. All right. So that's uh, the plan over the next uh, few few weeks. After that, I don't know what we'll be doing at all. So, so <laughs> it just depends. Just depends on what comes up. Yes, AJ, you, um, you, you uh, whetted my appetite with the, the laws of divine love, but you don't seem to be uh, uh, about to, to share them with us yet. I, I have already shared a lot of the laws of divine love already. Yeah, in, in past sessions. So my suggestion is to get a DVD about some of those laws. And I will be spending a lot more time on them in the future. But one thing I have noticed, and this is something I'd like to address to everyone, one thing I have noticed is that the sessions we've had about relationship with God have been the most poorly attended sessions. Now the reason why that is, is because there's still this feeling in many of you that you can't have a relationship with God. Does that make sense? Like that maybe God doesn't want you, or that you feel very frustrated in the relationship with God and so forth. So my suggestion is, what we'll be doing is this little series of talks, and then we'll be back on the relationship with God stuff again, and there we'll be talking about a lot of the principles of repentance, forgiveness, those kind of principles which are the highest laws. And my suggestion is hopefully by then you've worked through some of the emotions that prevent you from allowing a connection with God. Just allow yourself to work through what's going on with that relationship with God. So when I use the term God, many of you are still having trouble with that from an emotional perspective. Right? So allow yourself to, uh, to, give it, to get some trigger there. Many of you, when I talk about God, think, oh, it's all getting too religious now. Right? So, so allow yourself to work through that emotion because it's not about religion. This is about your personal relationship with God and your own growth eternally. Where does a religion get involved in that? So it's not about that. But obviously there's some emotions about that. So allow yourself to work through those emotions. So my suggestion is over the next four weeks what we're trying to do is just open up some of the things of natural love as well. The reason why we're doing that is myself and Mary have noticed that a lot of you are still doing unloving things to others in, the, in justification of you dealing with your emotions. Do you know what I mean by that? Like you start feeling some anger and rage and so what's the first thing you do? Sure. Find somebody, <laughs> find somebody who you can be angry and rage with, right? And away you go, right? That's not harmonious with law, as you'll work work out tomorrow, right? That's not harmonious with law. You're going to harm yourself doing that and harm the other person as well if they don't, if they have some emotions themselves that can be harmed through it. So allow yourself to start looking at that. You see what I'm saying? And this is one of the reasons why we're covering these subjects now because we feel that 
we feel that many times we're connecting with an emotion but unfortunately we're staying in this emotion of wanting to punish, blame or hurt other people underneath that emotion and into the real causal emotion and experiencing and releasing that emotion. Does that make sense? So that's why we're covering this stuff now for the next uh, two weeks or, so, or three weeks or so and then after that we'll get back onto this subject of, of our relationship with God and hopefully dealing with your emotions will be a little bit less traumatic because at the moment what's happening for many is you're feeling your emotion, projecting it another and then getting another law of compensation pain in your own soul. Can you see? that? That's like keeping you stagnant. Does that make sense? Dennis? AJ, why do we tend to do it to the people closest to us? Because it's easier. <laughs> no, like, like if I know someone's going to bop me on the nose if I'm angry, I'm going to not get angry with them. But, but if I know somebody's not going to bop me in the nose, then, I, then I'm a lot more willing to get angry with them. Can you see that? Yeah, but, it, but you, I don't know, I, you t I tend to find that it, it, it's someone who, who is really close, you know, your partner, your, your wife, whatever. Yep. They're the ones that, that tend to take the brunt of your crap. Yep, and they shouldn't, obviously. Um, and that's an issue of love of themselves as well as to whether they're doing that. So there's obviously issues of love of themselves they have to work through if they're, if they're in a situation where you're projecting anger at them and they're not acting upon it. But that's not your justification for your anger. Yeah. Yeah. All right? And this is why we want to talk about these two issues of love of self and love of others. It's very important you don't break those laws when you're on the divine love path. Can you understand why? It's called the divine love path. <laughs> Love, love path. There's a love path, right? So when you break the loving laws, there are going to be penalties upon your soul. And, and so the, the problem is, is that we can keep ourselves stagnant for some time if we do that, right? So um, what we want to do is help you get past that point of stagnation and into this place where you're really owning the underlying causal emotion rather than projecting this stuff at other people around you. Anyway, I'd like to thank you very much for your time today. And uh, tomorrow, look forward to your company if you're coming tomorrow. And thanks for also all of your donations that you've given today and, and in the past as well. And myself and Mary um, went out and got a reliable car at, at last. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it actually wasn't from your donations. <laughs> it was a courtesy of a thing called a MasterCard. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but one of the issues I'm working through is actually the issue of self-love. And, um, and one of the things that I've noticed personally with my issue of self-love is, is I have a lot of self-love except when it comes to emotions regarding my soulmate or emotions regarding my father, God. And so what, I've, what I'm working through now is this group of self-love emotions. And, uh, and so I'm personally having a lot of emotions to work through and having a lot of uh, tearful sessions. Uh, but in the process, uh, feeling quite differently, and even my body now is starting to feel a lot less pain than what it was feeling before as a result. So one of the reasons why we're also discussing this issue of self-love is so that I can sort of talk to you about some of these things that I've worked my way through and share with you how to actually work through your way through some of the issues you have with regard to your own love of self. So hopefully we can do that too over the coming over the coming months. But thank you for your time, guys. Okay.